So going back to that last series of videos, we just dis we discussed double sideband suppressed carrier amplitude modulation, right? So this was the first thing we discussed. This was what was in the chapter 4.2 of the textbook. And we basically said, right, to do this simple form of amplitude modulation, we're just going to take our message and we'll directly modulate it against some cosine wave with a carrier frequency, omega C. And when you do this, right, you may put it through some part of your system or something might happen that might change the amplitude a little bit. But this is your time domain signal for the double sideband suppressed carrier amplitude modulation. For this form of modulation, this DSBSC, what we have done is that we assumed, right, that we would have our message here that would enter a system that could modulate with the carrier frequency and then transmit. So we said there's some black box that could do the modulation and then transmit it. And we discussed what could go, we discussed some of the components that could go inside this black box. And so when you do that, you send out this message and let's say it's a wireless channel, you put it out in your wireless channel and you have this message going through the air. You imagine that it's an ideal channel and when your message, right, your DSBSC signal arrives at the receiver, you have another black box and inside of that black box, there are a few different options of circuits that we could build. And when you get to this black box, you receive this signal and this signal is identical to the signal that you sent from your transmitter. So there's no difference as it goes through the channel, nothing changes to your signal as it goes through the channel. And you simply just take this signal and that was sent at the transmitter and received and you just demodulate it with this frequency. So as you might expect, this idea is what causes us to realize that the DSBSC is not actually going to be that practical. So think back to our discussion on signal distortion. And we just talked about a few ways that signals can be distorted in a channel in chapter 3.6. And think back to that discussion and realize that there could be a number of things in our channel that cause distortion and we should think about what would be the effects of that distortion. So a real channel, if we put our signal through a real channel, there's a couple things that might happen. There's more, but these are two good ones to think about. The first is that there might be some Doppler frequency shift, all right? And this would result in this part of the signal uh, changing a little bit. So your carrier frequency may change a little bit, right? You may add or subtract some small, uh, delta of the frequency. Additionally, there may be a time delay in the channel, right? So that would affect this time and this time. And this would cause some, some delay in time in your channel. So then your DSB signal, after it goes through the channel, right? So you have a channel and you pass it through here and the channel introduces uh, shifts or delays. And then you get this signal where the time and the frequency have been affected. And if we were to combine this, right, we might be able to say that we still have our message here and it's modulating a cosine wave, but this cosine wave now has some small change in the frequency and there's some small difference in the phase. Well, do you remember what we said when we discussed the uh, circuits and demodulator components, we said that you need to make sure, you need to make very sure when you demodulate that you have the exact same cosine wave as the transmitter. Now, if you've introduced a uh, phase shift or a frequency change, you're no longer going to easily be able to demodulate. So looking at this from a channel perspective, we see if you have a real channel like this one, uh, it's going to have noise, distortion, real effects, right? Your signal, it may travel hundreds of miles through the atmosphere. Uh, it might travel through all kinds of different um, effects, bounce off buildings, et cetera, that are going to force uh, this, this signal that you get at the receiver. It's, it's no longer going to be the same as what you sent. And most importantly, this cosine wave no longer has the same frequency, no longer has the same phase. Therefore, you're going to have a lot of trouble actually performing the demodulation. Now, 
let's think about this. Could the receiver, could you use your, at your receiver? Is there some way that you could break up this received signal, somehow capture this cosine wave and use this exact cosine wave to demodulate this? So break this apart, apply it again for to generate this demodulation signal, demodulate normally and just get your message with a time delay. Well, it is certainly a possibility, but what's, what's this gonna do? This is gonna make your receiver much more expensive. And if your system has just one transmitter, but many receivers, this is going to be very bad, right? You don't want this to happen. Uh, and you also don't want tons of your receivers to be expensive. So imagine this, like uh, everyone has a TV set. So maybe 20, 30 years ago, everyone has a TV set with some uh, rabbit ears, right? Some rabbit ears or some loop antenna on top of your TV. You're all receiving some information that tells you what's on the channel. If this reception system is really expensive, you're just going to increase the price of these TVs by a lot. And everyone in America, everyone around the world had a TV. So those, if all of those TVs are really expensive, that's not a great thing. So better to find a way to reduce the price of the reception equipment, but make your transmitter much more expensive, right? So in the case where you have just one transmitter, just one, uh, just one transmitter, just one receiver, it's okay if either the transmitter or the receiver is very expensive. So if you're designing some specialized uh, communication equipment for uh, defense or military application or uh, something like that, right? You could have a really expensive system. But if you have a system uh, that has one transmitter, but many receivers like the television example, then you can have complexity and expense on one side, but not the other. And your complexity and expense, this should go onto the transmitter because every single time that you build a cheaper receiver, the expense reduction is going to be multiplied. So if you have a million cheaper receivers, right, your each additional receiver that you make that had a cost savings is going to be uh, multiplied for all those extra users. Now let's think about uh, one more thing here. Uh, with this DSBSC, which is that if we could transmit two signals, we might be able to uh, ease things up for us a little bit. So if, if we're going to go this route where we have one transmitter, but many receivers, right, we may want to add a little bit more complexity on one side than the other. And so that's what we're going to talk about in the next video is this idea that we could transmit two signals.